love you, Lord, for who you are, for who you are, God, King, Redeemer, Yeshua, and Savior, we love you, Lord. Just want to, I just want us to read a scripture this morning. Romans, if they can just put up for us Romans 3 verse 27. It's going to make sense what we're going to do this morning. It's going to bring alive maybe that side of your worship um, that is based on your personality. If I give a testimony this morning, I used to be a very personality-based worshiper. I'll tell you that now. I'm, I'm, I'm very social, but when it comes to music, I can be quite calm, right? So, but this week, God has refired a new level of worship in my life that goes beyond personality. Because praise is a command. It's a command. It, it, it goes beyond your personality, right? If you're an introvert, sorry. You, you just have to, you have to zama, you have to todda, you have to sella, you have to just, you gotta do it all. There are moments where you're sella, there's moments where you have to zama. You have to lift up your hands, you have to barak, you have to do that. You don't have, because it's a command, right? But this verse this morning really transformed my worship, which is uh, Romans, if you can just put it up, Romans 3 verse 27. If not, I can read it from here. I'll read it from here. So it says in the Amplified, it says in the Amplified, um, it says, then what becomes of our boasting? It is, is it excluded, entirely ruled out and banished? Or what, on what principle? on the principle of good or works? No, but on the principle of faith. It's not that we stop our boasting. It's not that we stop our shouting about Jesus. It's just that it's not about what we do. It's about who he is. So our boasting is more because it, it doesn't matter how we feel, we continue to boast because he's consistent. So this, I remember this week, I was just lifting up the name of Jesus, like, Lord, I feel like sometimes I'm not consistent, but you are good, and your mercy endures forever. So, Father, sometimes I feel like I can't pray, but you are good, and your mercies endure forever, and you are wonderful, and you are glorious, and you died on the cross, and you are the lamb that was slain, and you are the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I just had to find, I had to, I had to research, I had to give myself knowledge to boast on him. He is El Kanar, he is Adonai, he is El Shalom, he is my peace, he is my hope, he is my firm foundation. Without him I shake, without him I can't stand. So this morning before we worship, go ahead and boast in God this morning. Don't feel like you have to be and stand where you are, just boast in him. He is your righteousness, he is your cornerstone, there is none like him. He is my firm foundation, he is my hope in ages past, he is the head, Father Lord, he is the head of the church and he and we are his crown we are his diadem he is faithful he is lord he is king he is adonai he is the way maker we love him we bless him come on just open up your mouth and bless him this morning he is the way the truth the life no one can come to the father except through him for there is a river that flows from the throne of grace that makes glad the city of god he is our refuge and when we call upon him we are safe because the name of the lord is a strong tower the righteous come on boast in him this morning he is our confidant he is our refuge he is my comfort there is none like the holy one of israel there is none like the holy one of israel there is none like the king of zion there is none 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 we make boast 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 in you Jesus Savior's love 
hope is built on nothing less. Come on. Then Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. You see, now one more time with confidence. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing.
the throne, Christ the Lord, cornerstone, we can be strong in the Savior. Come on, through the storm, through the Lord of all. Christ the Lord, cornerstone, who we can be strong in the Savior, the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ the Lord, Christ the Lord.
through the storm and through the storm. He, come on, you got to declare it this morning. And through the, no matter what we pass through, no matter what we walk through, yea, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He remains Lord. Yes, He is through the storm, through together. There was a moment where the lights went out and death had claimed his victory. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned and all the breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known can we sing one more time there was a moment everyone say there was a moment when the light lit up When death had claimed his victory The king of love had given up his life Oh, 
the darkest day in history. Oh, there on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse, his blood atoned. Yeah, one final breath and he was finished. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake, and the veil was born. What sacrifice was made? Yes, and the
a song from the belly of your spirit. The rivers that flow from our belly are not just tongues. It's the songs of the spirit. Hallelujah. 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 I just heard in my spirit something strange, but I love it. The Lord is like, sing hallelujah and praise him for the souls he's about to bring into the kingdom of God this year. Praise him for the bountiful harvest. Praise him for the bountiful harvest. The hallelujah that you're gonna sing is for all the people in darkness we've been praying for to receive Jesus and to know him. And he's like, I've heard your prayers and I know you've gone out, but have you praised him for what he's going to do? Have you praised him for the people he's gonna bring and he's gonna call back into his kingdom? So today, let's intercessorily pray and praise him for the many people he's bringing. It's hallelujah for my brother and my sister and my mother hallelujah for my boss and my friends and my friends oh god hallelujah 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 say hallelujah hallelujah Worship will do. Hallelujah. 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 Hey, hallelujah. Over Ilford we sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. 
Where's your desperation? All I need is you. There's too many idols in your heart. Come on, say that all I need is you, Lord. Is you, Lord. And all I need is you. And all I want is you. And all I need.
one desire, Jesus. And all I need is you. I hear the Father saying that he says, I love you. And my love for you is everlasting. 
He says that I will never leave nor forsake you. This is the truth. Our God is always with us. His nature is not that of man of any, or of any created thing. He is your strength in weakness. He is your constant. He says, you are the apple of my eye. We must learn to receive God's love. strength you are everything everything to us you are everything oh God in Jesus name amen amen how sweet the Lord's presence here yes hallelujah how are you guys good good it's good to see your beautiful and handsome faces <laughs> going to do take an offering now <clears throat> thank you worship team god bless you guys well thank you for leading us in into his heart into his glory <clears throat> so offering uh, many of you would have heard this joke before <laughs> but yeah there's there's this projector screen coming down behind me right that that's not the joke <laughs> okay <laughs> So the Lord told me to share this joke, and I'm going to try my quickest to share it, okay? So there were three types of people uh, who came into the house of the Lord to give. And those of you who've heard it, don't start laughing in advance, okay? Wait for the joke to come. So the first, let's make it guys, okay? So the first guy, he came, and he put a bucket here. You know, not, not, you know the small bucket where you can barely put like a hand in. Yeah, he put that bucket, and then he looked at the Lord and said, and he took a wad of cash, like a wad of money, say a couple of thousand pounds. Yeah, a couple of thousand pounds. <laughs> and he said, Lord, I'm going to throw this up in the air, and whatever falls in the bucket is for me. Whatever falls outside the bucket is for you. Yeah. So he throws this money up. And just one 20 pound note goes into the bucket. All the rest. So he's like, generous guy, whatever he has to do. So he gives the rest to the Lord, to the church, and he takes the 20 pound. Then another guy right behind him comes and be like, ooh, that's tough. So he takes his wad of a couple of thousand pounds and he says, Lord, whatever falls in the bucket is for you, whatever falls outside is for me. And he throws it up, and whatever fell in the bucket, so he sewed into the. Then there was a third guy. <laughs> he came with his wad of cash, and he was like, wow, this is really tough. And he looks at the Lord and says, Lord, whatever I throw up is yours. Whatever comes down is mine. <laughs> yeah. Our church is not like that. We're generous. <laughs> I know you're generous because I've been doing life with you guys for a long time. So here's the truth. As a Christian, can you be poor? Yeah, you can. But what, what, what's the debate in that? You know, is it, is it wrong to be poor financially? No. Does God want to bless you financially? Yes. But I've had moments, times, seasons in my life where we lacked financially. And there's no shame in saying that. That doesn't determine who our God is. But one thing I can say is we, my children didn't go without food. My children didn't go without joy. My children knew that their sustenance is from God. 
But as Christians, we can't be stingy in character and nature. Yeah, we might be poor or rich, but stinginess is not from, the God, from God. That's not the character of God. And that's not the nature of God. So Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. What does this say? Wealth is not a mark or a sign of, true, of a true genu genuine believer. As a believer in Christ, wealth is not a sign whether you're a believer or not. Let's debunk that. Hallelujah. The true sign is when you are getting an overflow Whenever you get, you get overflow with thankfulness and gratitude to God. That's the true sign of a believer, a son or daughter of God. Thankfulness and gratitude that we live from that place. Amen? Are you guys with me? And generosity. Generosity is from God. All right? Our arms are not tied. The motive of giving is not to sow financially and get a financial doubling back. And I want to apologize to us and the church on behalf of the church for manipulating giving. Historically, we've seen, I've seen it. You sow a thousand, you get a ten thousand. You sow a hundred, you get a car. The motive changes. This scripture starts by saying, honor the Lord with your possessions. You are honoring God with your money. That is the true motive of the heart in giving. You're not giving so that, ah, I get back. No, I honor God. You and I, our lives don't belong to us anymore. If you believe unto the Lord Jesus and you've confessed with your mouth and you've believed in your heart that he is Lord... He is Lord and Master over you and everything that you are. We live a life to honor and glorify Jesus here on earth. Our life must glorify Him. Our generosity must blow the minds of the world out. And that is true generosity and giving. The motive for giving financially, I'm going to say it, giving money to the church is to honor God. And I can say this is good soil. I've been part of this house since we started. And I know where we give our money. And I know what helps we do, what missions we do. How many of you know that who's, who kind of know things about here? There we go. There's a bunch of us know that truth. So we're not going to be shy in saying that it's good to give. It is good to give. I feel a lot of us shut down when the offering message is taken. They don't know. They don't know what I'm going through. I actually don't know what you're going through. No one will. But honoring God is above any circumstance or situation of your life. Look at Job's life in the Bible. Lost his family, everything. He chose not to say one bad thing about God. He honored God. So if you're, if you're not giving, it's as simple. Motive is not to get rich. The motive is not to impress God. Even worship. Worship is, oh, that's not my song. It's not my vibe. It's not my, no, sorry, worship? Who is that too? Worship is our offering to God. We can't impress God with our worship. But we give it to Him willingly. So, <clears throat> giving, if you're not giving, you're not honoring God. So don't be surprised that you're not giving him authority or his kingship over the source of where your finance is coming from, your work or anything. You're telling God, I'll manage this. Don't worry. I know better than you. Yeah? Uh, if you have any debates or questions about this, come to me on Tuesday afternoon with lunch, and then we'll talk. You know, the Bible, Jesus talked about the widow with the two mites. It was about generosity. She wanted to give. Many of us have been exposed to the misuse of giving. We live to honor and glorify God, not for ourselves. 
It's not for ourselves. And, and there's a, you know, the second commandment. I don't know who said it recently. Someone said it recently that, oh, yes, I know. Paul, Paul Manwaring was teaching here at the mentoring group. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that means we must love ourselves. Why? Because you and I, we are the sons and daughters of the living God. You and I, we were purchased by the blood of Jesus. We must have value for our own lives. And if you don't love your life, it's not about getting obsessed with your life. You guys get me, right? You won't love others. Give because you love God. The scripture is not honoring, it's not about honoring God about your time, your strength. No, it's your possessions, literally what you own. Uh, it's like saying um, fasting, I'm fasting this fasting season from Instagram and Facebook. No, fasting biblically is fasting from food. I'm fasting from, uh, I don't know, playing tennis. No, that's not fasting. Fasting is fasting from food. It's as simple as that. Biblical. Be give because you love the Lord. All right, we have three ways to give. If the ushers can pass out the offering envelopes. You can either give to this envelope. There's a QR code that will come up that you can give through our app. And you can give through bank transfer as well. And I, I actually, I love when, I, I remember when Math, Math Shine came a few weeks ago and took an offering message. He said, we're a generous church. It's because we know we're a generous church. We're a giving church. And <clears throat> give ownership over to God in the area of your finances. Amen? One thing is, we said the motive, right? So check your motive. Check our motive in giving. Am I giving to the Lord because I love him? Because I believe in what God is doing. All right? Motives of the heart is very important to the Lord. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah. Is the offering box thing here? Thank you. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Thank you, Don. Come on, bless, bless him as he brings that offering box. Bless you, bro. Just before you give your offering, one minute. I'm going to take a minute. I, I've taken 12 minutes now, I think. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh, sorry. A lot of times you and I are in control of our motives of our heart. And we must be. It's not God's job to change the motive. God rewards us. A lot of times we want to control the reward. And we say, Lord, help me with my motives. And half the time we're repenting to get that motive right. That motive has to change today and now. And let God reward you in his sovereignty. God's not a debtor to anyone. He pours out abundantly. All right? So, Father, I bless every offering that's fed and made in this house. Every financial offering, every money sown, Father, you are the rewarder, Father God. Change, we decide right now that our motive is to honor you and it's because we love you and it's because you have ownership over everything in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to welcome Eben up. Let's all stand up and honor this guy. He's going to bring the word today. Come on, Eben. Oh, you can give, meanwhile, as he comes. You can sew in there. Where is Eben? Where is... There. <laughs> Come on, bro. Oh, he wants to take the pulpit down. All right. Bless you guys. Come on, stretch your hands towards him. Is it weird that I'm up here? <laughs> Come on. Father, we bless Eben and we receive him as your son. And we receive the word that he brings, which is you, Jesus. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirit, everything to what your son brings, Father God. And as one family, we stand and we say we receive you and the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Go. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I am a work in progress. 
I say that because I am known for filling this whole thing up. But today, my iPad is smaller. My Bible is here, and just I've got a book. And <laughs> it, um, thank you, Lord. So we just uh, turn our attention to the Lord. I just felt like just uh, to begin by just uh, reading from Exodus 33, 34, very familiar passage to all of us. Um, I loved what you just finished with, Pastor Jim. Like, um, God works from different ways in our lives to really work at our motives. But at the end of the day, we are responsible to how we steward our heart. He is, uh, you know, when we, we've often used the phrase, God woos our heart, right? And the picture that comes to my mind is uh, a boat with uh, a rope that's stuck on an anchor and the water level keeps rising and the rope gets off the anchor, the, the stand and it just goes into the deep. And it's like the boat is not in control, but the sea is controlling the boat sort of thing. And I feel this is how God wants to really come into our lives. In, in this passage, this is Moses interceding on behalf of the nation. He is, God is angry with his people. And Moses is this middleman between God and his people. And he's also angry with his people, but he has a pain and he wants to, it's almost like, please, they don't know what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing, but please. And it's in that kind of a scenario where he's praying this. Um, verse third, chapter 33, verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, see, see you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I have found favor in your sight. Please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Psalms 103 talks about the, um, the psalmist makes a distinction. The people of God knew the acts of God. Moses knew the ways of God. So the acts of God, the different ways through which God in, intervenes in your life, thrills us. We are happy. Hey, got the breakthrough. Praise God. But through that, God is wanting to take us to another place of knowing his ways. I want to encourage some of us today. Can you pray that prayer? God, there is a frustration in the church and a frustration with God that God has towards his church. And this frustration is that we are not maturing. I am not maturing. And that's God's frustration that I, have, that I am grappling in my heart, God has towards me. And part of this journey of maturing is actually saying, God, I, I'm blessed because you have blessed me. But Lord, I want to know you as my, I want to know you. And Moses is praying, I, uh, I want to know you. And then God says this, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. How many of you desire his presence? More than the answer to your prayer, the presence of God. More than anything else in your life. Your, your loving kindness is better than life itself. This is the kind of people that God is wanting to make in this earth, in this planet. His body, his bride. Not a bride that is half-heartedly pursuing him but he is trying to woo his pride in this season Jesus Lord we thank you Lord we give our hearts to you we give ourselves to you completely Anastal Prabada Hantal Prabahashta Karabrasi Kate Piri Atal Prabata Hastada De Mantala Prabala Gadagasi. Lord, we've not come to play church. We are the church and you are our head. And we want your life to flow into us. 
into each body part that we have gathered today, Lord. We want your life. We want you to be our vision. Lord, I thank you that you're strengthening the weaker body parts today, Lord. Just lay hands on the person next to you. I'll make sure it won't be for too long. But Father, I thank you for this person next to me, Lord. Jesus, your blood was shed that I might come into your body and this person next to me might come into your body. Lord, I am their body part. They are my body part. Lord, would you release a revelation of this truth into our hearts, Lord. God, deliver us from selfishness, Lord. Deliver us from individualism, Lord. Jesus, deliver us, Lord. Lord, circumcise our hearts today, Lord. Lord, would you give me a burden for the person next to me, Lord. Lord, I receive them into my life, into my heart, Jesus. And I give myself to them, Lord. Some of your breakthroughs are dependent on you praying for this person next to you. Karta, Limbra, Dhanasta, Al Prabana, Arthal Prabana, Gadagadaradi Balkara. Father, take us into the depth of church. Life, Lord. Haraba, ribal kama na gadaga, sabala, braba, dagal kara, dagal kara. We don't want the show. We want your life. We want to be transformed into your image, Lord. Jesus, cleanse us, purify us, pour out your Spirit upon us. Hora mantakaba, in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, for this family that you have brought me into and you have blessed this family into my life, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is the, the verse of the month that we have. It's a theme that we are... Uh, looking as a family, it says uh, from 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22, for as, as by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, and so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Um, so in preparation for this, I, I was prayed and I got drawn to the book of Corinthians. How many of you are familiar with the first letter, letter of Paul to the Corinthians? Good. Um, so some of you might know I'm actually doing my um, study, my master's in practical theology. And what practical theology is, is basically a theological reflection on the intersection between theology, church, and culture. This letter is Paul's theological reflection on to the church at Corinth who is who has so basically the church in Corinth has the world in the church and the church in the world and there is no nothing that is delineating the church from the from the world the church is meant to be the salt and the light and that saltiness and the light comes from our union with Christ. It is not a light that we produce from ourselves. So there is a statement that says church exists for the people of the world. I quasi agree with that statement. Because I believe the church exists for the glory of God. Primarily. Jesus called his disciples to himself and then he sent them out. 
And so that order of priority has to be our priority as the church. We have to glorify God in the pursuit of God's glory. God will release us, burden us for the people. When we have, when we prioritize, when the priorities change, the things that we produce will will be um, aligned to our priorities. And so what we have in Corinth, it starts the church at Corinth was planted by Paul in around AD 50. And this was after he, it's in Acts chapter 18. He was there for 18 months. He begins his ministry at the, the synagogue in Corinth. And that's how he normally used to preach. He would go to the Jews and talk to them about the Jewish Messiah, Christ, who came, fulfilled the law. And in light of that, how they were to respond to God's faithfulness to the people of Israel. And the Jews would harden their hearts, reject him, and he would ultimately go on to speak to the Gentiles. He says, okay, guys, it'll get interesting, right? So (laughs) I say that because the thing is, let's be honest, who cares about Corinth? But I think we should. That's what I'm trying to hopefully put in our hearts. We should care about this. Because we've discussed this before. When the human author of the scriptures is writing something, he has, a, he has a particular context he's writing into. The person receiving the letter is also in a particular context. But over that, there is a divine author inspiring the human author. So the more closer we get to the meaning of the intent of the writing of the human author, we'll get to understand the meaning. So in our discussions, we probably say, Oh, what does this mean to you? That is probably not a good question to ask. We should ask, what does it actually mean? Sorry. Instead of asking, what does it mean to you? So we've come to the individual all too quickly instead of asking, what does the, act, what does the scripture actually mean in its context? So that tells us there is work cut out for us. We we get sometimes impressed and sometimes scared by the impact of Islam. And in Daniel it says, they that know, the people that know their God will do exploits. Right? So they know a God of their book and they are doing that kind of exploits. Our lack of exploits tells us our lack of knowledge of our God. And you cannot have a knowledge of God apart from the book that God has given to us. So it's an, it's, a, it's, not, it's an encouragement for all of us. Let's take this seriously. It, and it's when we give ourselves to it, grace comes to grow in it. I've been talking to some of us. We've all been experiencing this fresh hunger to be in the scriptures. May the Lord help us. So let me go through quickly. So what happens in Corinth is it begins by uh, Paul. He also meets Aquila and Priscilla very significant couple in the New Testament. And that actually happens in the city of Corinth. They are already tent makers. Paul is also tent making. And then Timothy and Silas comes. And so it's a team leadership that is beginning to plant a church or gospel work in that community of Corinth. They start at the synagogue. The synagogue does not receive them. And right next to the synagogue, there is a guy called Gaius. And so the church planting starts in the house of Gaius. And then the synagogue leader becomes a Christian too. And so that's how the church is starting. 18 months he is doing the work of the Lord. He goes away. He has to go for different circumstances. And he's in Ephesus. And Chloe is one of the house church leaders who writes to Paul and says about the different things that's happening in Corinth. So Corinth is like a city like Las Vegas. It is a very corrupted city. The goddess Aphrodite has a temple. And so temple prostitution is the normality in that culture. And so if people were to go to Corinth, it was like, oh, so you've been to Corinth. That's the kind of uh, idea that Corinth was for people. And into that city, God, is, God has a people that he's redeemed by his blood. And yet he is working on that people. And so what Chloe talks to uh, Paul is, there's division in the church. 
there is a man sleeping with his father's wife there are men going to temple prostitutes and coming and sitting in the church there are people falling sick all this kind of a mess exists in the church that's the church of corinth and the beauty in that is god's grace does not find us at a place where we pretend to be he finds us where we are so some of us we were just discussing this with my wife uh, julie i was just saying some well julie was saying sometimes you know when our house is such a mess that's sometimes how the church is or sometimes a reflection of how we are to the lord if these are all signposts communicating where things are in our lives so if you have your room that's room that's not clean make sure to clean it but it might actually be communicating something else as well one of the things that i've been learning in this season is oh, the lord is teaching me is my primary ministry is to my wife my taking care of her not in a way that is self fulfilling but in a way that is to glorify him in that way i am actually becoming more fruitful for his glory because the closest relationships in our life is the very relationship that god wants us to focus into but those relationships are the very place that we get the most hurts and the most mis being misunderstood and often when conflicts come we take a bit of a distance so that the the intensity of the conflict dies down and then we come back but that is actually a false intimacy it's a false closeness and so when conflicts come press into healing and to come closer that is the harder journey to take but i want to encourage you by the spirit of god in prayer by giving yourselves to god in prayer and say god cuz we try to solve problems with our own understanding pros 3 is beautiful when it says lean not on your own understanding how much of our life is led by our own understanding and how much of our life is led by us taking a moment to recognize what the spirit is wanting so we love the book by brother lawrence that talks about the practicing the presence of god or to be uh, uh, to have a, you know ecstasy of god's presence but many times we won't have it the feeling won't be there yet we need to learn to rest be sensitive to his leadings amen so paul is writing to a church that is absolutely messy this is how he starts the church, the the letter paul called by the will of god to be an apostle of christ jesus and our brother sosthenes the word in philippines into the, the letter to philippi paul recognizes himself as a born servant but the letter to corinth he's saying i'm an apostle very intentional because that is um uh, contesting about his leadership from the church so that's the context into which he's writing to the church of god that is in corinth to those sanctified in christ jesus notice there's two locations for the church one in the city of corinth and the other loca- location is that you are in christ and so also remember this is actually being written t- to the church we read it to eben in christ in in london called to be a saint we don't write we don't so this is also is very important that we immerse ourselves into the text to let the text speak for itself and then adjust our life to what the text wants us to do right it's important that we do this um because then and only in that place will we change um call upon the name of the lord our jesus christ both their lord and ours grace to you peace from god our father and the lord jesus 
I give thanks to you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. In every way you are enriched in him, all speech and all knowledge. So in, we are very familiar with 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Paul is bringing correction to the practice of speaking in tongues and the spiritual gifts. But here he starts off by saying, you're enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. He's recognizing the gifts and he's saying the gifts are meant to enrich you in him. It's meant to strengthen you. It is meant to keep you till the end. But the gifts in Corinth are being used as a, hey, look at me, I got tongues. Look at me, I got prophecy. Look at me, I got teaching. That's what they were doing. But Paul is saying the reason, and he's, so one thing that we'll see in the book, you can go home, read it. I won't go, there's 16 chapters. There's no way we can go into the book today. Unless we can. No, we shouldn't. So, so here what's happening is they, are, they have everything that, is, that they can have in Christ. But they don't know what to do with what they have. Their thinking about what they have is not exactly how God intended in giving them the gifts. So there is a real change in thinking that God wants to bring through this letter to his people. And that is our biggest challenge. The, the most mature people are the people that are always wanting to grow. That is always wanting to be challenged in their perspectives. In their existing convictions. See, it's, see some convictions are non-negotiable. We've reached there already. But our practice of other things, our understanding of other things need to be increased as we grow. Okay. Um, Verse number nine, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Before I unpack verse number nine, he, um, Paul, knowing everything about the church in verse two is describing the church to be in Christ. That's encouraging, right? So in your mess, God sees you in Christ. That is if you are in Christ. So there is a very important teaching that we need to understand from the scriptures. There is a difference between a believer and a non-believer. God loves everybody, but his love, covenant love towards his people is different to, to those that are not in Christ. Right? And it's not uh, don't come in. It's a come in kind of love, but the, the expectations and the change and the things that God does in our life is very different to those that are outside. And so that's how we need to understand how the letters are written. In our day and age, we don't value church membership. We don't value being plugged into a local church, the importance of being part of a church family. We have, my mentor would say, this relationship out of sight, out of mind. Meaning when a person is not there in front of you, we don't even think about them. We don't, they don't exist. And so, one of the challenges that Paul brings into this, uh, in this letter is to become very Christ-focused. We'll talk into that. But also become very spiritual. So, the problem that we have, so in verse number 9, I'll, we'll take this good verse and then go into verse 10. So, verse number 9 says, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ. How aware are you of this fellowship? I want to encourage you, your fellowship with Christ is to be enjoyed in the context of the church and outside of the church. Increase in that. Pray and ask the Lord, Lord, help me to understand this fellowship. So I came to Jitin before. I, said, I came and hugged him. I was like, okay, how are you doing? And I, was, I told him, and it made me think. I was like, I worship by just uh, hugging Jitin. And it made me think, actually, in my fellowship, in my freedom in Christ, my reconciliation, I'm not, I don't have any problems, but my connection with Jitin is a big, important thing in God's heart. My disconnection with him is actually very grieving to him. So some of us will come to church and we'll have a grievance with anybody and everybody, but we'll have, oh, Jesus, how beautiful. 
and you are blissed out in your own little world and the servant finishes and you jump out you have no connection with god's people and so you are you in yourself you're asking god i want to grow in you i want to become more christ like and probably he the holy spirit is probably saying can you get vulnerable with a person can you love a person in your life can you go through the discomfort of actually connecting with someone else it's hard guys it is hard but this is the call of the church life this is the call of the christian life and because and i i am coming under the weight of this word because the church on once on one level is an army amen it is a rescue boat yes and amen it is also a hospital it is also meant to be the safe place for those that are hurting those some people just want a hug some people just want to be thought about and if you're thinking about them just send them a text reach out to them just these things grow you spiritually grows the church spiritually it allows christ to come into our midst in much greater ways simple things and lord would you help us to become your family your body and so it says i appeal to you brothers verse number 10 by the name of our lord jesus christ that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment and so the word when it says that you be united in the esv in the kjv and it has this idea of repair that needs to happen there is disunity and how the unity has to come about is being is by what it says so i appeal to you by the name of the lord jesus christ so the lord jesus christ has to become a united vision in that united vision of christ our disunities can be put aside cuz who he is and so how paul deals with this disunity i'm just going to go through my heart is in the little time that we have 1 corinthians 1 2 3 4 and 15 cuz the the theme verse is from 15 right so how paul is trying to deal with this division his first thing he addresses is the division idea and he paul is very long winded man i i think well i feel like i'm long winded this guy can just keep talking and he'll bring and it's like whatever comes into his mind he just puts in and then you and then it's put work for us like well, what did you think of that when you said that like we have to go find anyways god is god help us and so paul is saying Chloe said this some people follow apollos from see one thing as a church as a believer in christ some of you are probably new into our church family consider this am i coming to church for the personality that speaks at a church or am i coming to church because as a believer in christ i am meant to be part of the body of christ does that make sense it's so important because the gospel i've said this before the gospel does the heavy lifting for us as a believer as a church the gospel is the very thing that needs to unite us it is not a worship moment that excites us it's christ amongst us and in us that should unite us hallelujah so this is again so what happened what paul goes on to talk about this division is because you are immature because your thoughts about christ is immature and when your thoughts about christ is immature your life will reflect immaturity immature thoughts that are prevalent in the world is prevalent in the church oh this worship was not great so that means you are sensually moved if it feels good it is good you have not trained yourselves to discern the anointing through your spirit Why is it that when songs about the lamb are sung there is there is an anointing it's not about the 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 quality of worship but when the lamb is glorified when throne room songs are sung there are there is a glory that is incredible and where do you sense that in your spirit 
Hallelujah. Help us to become more spiritual, Lord. Not just be moved by our feelings. Because w- culture works against our discipleship. And so we have to work twice as hard to be discipled in Christ through God's word, through God's people, through the means of grace that God has for us. Amen. And it, it is, and so, see, I feel like I'm going to go on a rabbit trail. I've stopped myself. Okay. The word of Christ. So let's go into verse number 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So Paul is saying, my main message called the cross of Christ, the crucified Christ, is the very thing that will unite us. He'll get into that. He will elaborate that in the, in the next verses. One of the things that's happening in Corinth, there, are philosoph- there is philosophy in amongst the Greek that impresses the Greek. The Jews are impressed by signs and wonders. And so these two natural, worldly, impressive realities are impressing the people in the church. So when I said... Are you moved by sensuality when you come to church? Is that you are being discipled by the world to think a certain way. The church in Corinth is moved by science and wonders and some wowing ideas about God. But Paul is saying, God forbid. And he says in in chapter 2, I was with you. I did not come to you with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to, I determined this in some versions, beautiful rendering, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because you know why? Because there's nothing appealing about the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He is crushed, he's made to look inhumane. One of the ideas being said is beyond, when it says he was made to look beyond human resemblance, the idea being communicated is, is this human? So on the cross, Jesus is becoming what you and I really are. The people putting Jesus on the cross could not recognize the Lord of glory that they are crucifying. That same blindness is the state of humanity. And yet it is that crucified Christ suffering the crucifixion that takes away the blindness. Does that make sense? This wisdom of God, which God, well, Paul describes it as the foolishness of God. The weakness of God. So on the cross, Jesus is naked, stretched out. He's not, he cannot cover his private parts because he's on the cross, nailed. And as he is being humiliated, the principalities and powers are being pulled down. There is nothing appealing about this Christ. Yet, through that work of Calvary, he has become beautiful to us. That is salvation. Before you knew him, you thought that was foolishness. You thought that was, what is this? But today you know the value of the one that was crucified. Like a lamb led to its, sheer, to its what's the slaughter. A lamb being led does not know that it's about to be slaughtered. But Jesus being led knew exactly what was happening. He embraced a voluntary weakness. He, there are three times when it says, yet he opened not his mouth. So he opened not his mouth. And there was no deceit in his mouth. This Christ, when this Christ becomes your meditation, this Christ will become your boast. When this Christ becomes your everything, It changes you from the inside out. So the Holy Spirit's resurrection power that works in the inside of you 
is to give you the strength to meditate upon this crucified Christ. The sight that we in our natural senses want to look away from. But by the spirit we keep gazing at the crucified lamb. The lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. By looking at him he changes us from the inside out. I want to encourage our church family. Make Jesus Christ and him crucified the boast of our lives. Take a moment to just reflect and think. What is the thing that defines you? At the deepest core of who you are. What is the thing that satisfies you? Defines you? Gives you meaning? What are you living for? At all those points. Christ crucified. Put him there. Put Christ crucified at the deepest part of who you are. That should define us. When Christ crucified becomes the reality of your life, your future is in him. Our biggest fear is about our future. But put your mind into Christ, into his crucifixion, into his resurrection. Fill your mind with the reality of who he is. Hallelujah. It's not because we don't, we don't have anything else to say. That's the reality. We can say things, but like Paul, we are choosing not to say anything else than this. We are not trying to talk about revival and glory. He is the glory. He is my revival. He is everything. He is the altar. He is the prize. He is everything. As a church, make him our everything. We don't gather for personalities. We gather for him. He is our reward. He is the pearl of great price that we will give our life to. And we will work for our relationships. We will cut every disconnections in the name of Jesus. Every divisions are removed in the name of Jesus. And we will come closer because he is worthy. The reality of church life is that the person next to you is probably the person that will hurt you the most. But God in his wisdom will also bring healing through that very person. So... Christ at the cross, we want, we, we are so elated to connect with him. But he is saying, you want more of me? Connect with the person next to you. Hallelujah. So when Paul is appealing to the church at Corinth, he does not use the phrase Christ resurrected. He uses the phrase Christ crucified. He's not negating the resurrection because one whole chapter in chapter 15, he deals with the resurrection. But in this context, to deal with the pride of the people at Corinth, he has to glorify the crucified Christ. When he is gazed at, every boast that you and I have, apart from him, comes crashing down, has to burn. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go into 1 Corinthians 15. Thank you, Lord. Is Yvonne here? Oh, hi, Yvonne. Bless you, Yvonne. No, because last week on Thursday, we had a little session on teaching on the crucified Christ. And Yvonne brought some beautiful revelations. I was just... Just thought about it. So in 1 Corinthians 15. So one of the, th again, in, uh, Paul is dealing with um, not just the divisions, not just the sexual immorality that's happening. There are questions that people have asked. What do we do in this situation? What do we do when this happens? What do we do? So there are different situations that Paul is specifically dealing with. And also a doctrinal error that exists in the church. So people are saying, the resurrection does not exist. The resurrection is all, it, it, it's not a big deal. So there, and so it's, you, can, you can identify how it's probably a sad, you see, idea. They have sad, you see. <laughs> so, so they don't believe in the resurrection. And so that idea has somehow influenced the Jews amongst the church, within the church. And so, this verse, for as, um, okay, let's start here. The reason we are gathered 
is because there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. If that is not there, we are really fooling ourselves. We are fooling ourselves, we are fooling everybody. But it is there. There is an empty tomb. My faith is on that, seriously. If that empty tomb is not there, I'm sorry, I'm, I've given my life over for nothing, but I haven't. I've given my life to him who is alive. He could not remain dead. At the cross, he's dying, taking our sin. So in Romans 4, it says towards the end, it says, he was handed over, he was delivered over for our sins. And he was resurrected because of our justification. So his death on the cross was not for him, but for us. And that's why the only sin, the unforgivable sin, is the sin of rejecting him. He did not die for himself. He died for us. And so, his death on the cross was such a perfect work. So, even, so if we believed in a Jesus who did not die, we would still get the blessings of the law. But when Jesus died, taking our sin upon him, the curse of the law is broken. Amen. So that is why, again, this blessing and curse, there are different uh, deep teachings on it. Just a, a side idea, right? If you sense in your walk with God, if you sense there are curses in your lineage, break it in Jesus' name. Don't make it a big deal. It's only a big deal as much as he tells you, you deal with it in prayer. Nothing more, nothing less. You are in Him. He is in you. Become more conscious of your union with Him. From that place, deal with things that comes in your way. Amen? And so, Jesus' death on the cross is taking care of the curse of the, the, the bit of the law that we could not live up to. He lived it perfectly. So, His death was a a death instead of us, he takes, one of the reasons Jesus could not remain dead was because he was sinless. The greatest equalizer amongst humanity in history is death. Why is that? Everyone is born a sinner and the soul that sin must die. But if Jesus died, death is defeated because he's sinless. Romans 4 says his death was for our sins. And because his life is so sinless and his death was a voluntary death, death had to defeat, be defeated. So twofold reasons. One, he is sinless. Second, his death on the cross was a voluntary taking off our sins. And because he was sinless, those sins were punished righteously. So every Distance you have between you and God is taken care of completely at the cross. At the cross, you meet with God. And so the cross is like this divine bridge where God comes down, you go up to God through Jesus. In Jesus, we can call him Abba. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is good news. This is the greatest news. Let this news never become old news. Please. Please, 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 that, shake yourself awake. And so, in Isaiah 53, he, the suffering servant is described as the arm of the Lord. In the Old Testament, you have the language of the arm of the Lord describing the power of God. And what is the big picture that comes into our mind? It's the Exodus account. When God's people are taken through the dry, waters, dry land of Red Sea, the Bible describes that act as God's arm working that. It's his power. At the cross in Isaiah 53, the arm of the Lord is being crushed. He's revealing his power. The arm of the Lord is doing the will of the Lord. Hallelujah. So let Jesus become our boast. I think I've spoken enough. I will close today and uh, I'll lead up to Rachel but let's just pray father we thank you for this time Jesus we love you 
we thank you for your perfect work on Calvary, Lord. Thank you for crying, it is finished. Father, renew our minds, Lord. Renew our hearts, renew. Lord, we give ourselves to be changed by you. We don't want to remain the same. We want to be changed by you. Lord, us as a church, would you conform us to your likeness? Would you lead us into your will more and more? In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll just, uh, <laughs> yes, so let me just quickly, that particular verse, right? For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ, we'll all be made alive. So in Adam, we are born. So there are two, so how God sees humanity, according to scripture, is there are two federal heads. Adam representing humanity and in Adam's sin all have died all have sinned and all have died so there's only one destiny one end point that is death that is marked out for us everyone and you see if you think about death Hebrews 4 talks about it how the fear of death is one of the biggest fears that people are actually facing people are trying to escape it modern society has so much noise to actually distract people from thinking about death so it works in two ways one is the enemy tries to distract us from coming to become sober about the reality of death the enemy also works in another way when people are actually in doomed become hopeless he takes their hope to the point of hopelessness to lead them to take their own life so I've I've spent some time with uh, a friend of mine who actually was suffering from suicidal thoughts. And he was, t I, I wanted to know, because I've never, that's never been a struggle for me. Not to say that I've not struggled in other areas, but for me, that was not a struggle. And he was, and I wanted to understand what is happening. And so what he told me was in those moments of actually considering suicide, he's lost so much hope that the whole, Hopeful thing is to actually end his life. And so the enemy works extra time. It's a spirit that attacks people. At the same time, there are situations that they are stuck under. But God can break through. It's something we need to understand. And so he was telling me how there was a spirit. There were times it would come back. But he got delivered from it. So if that is you, I wasn't planning to say this. But if that is you, there is deliverance in the name of Jesus. Receive that by faith. If that is you, that is not your portion. Jesus died to give you life. Not for you to take your own life. Your life is to be given to him in delight. In seeing him. And so all are born to die. But Christ comes with an indestructible life. And he comes and gives his life. So our union with him has brought about... So there are so many realities that takes place in our union with him but the union is not lived from our own power your union with Christ is who, where you are today but you're not living by your own willpower your union has brought union with his resurrection life the life that defeated death so, the, so Jesus' resurrection was before the age to come. His resurrection is our destiny. How he resurrected with his glorified body is prophecy for where you and I are headed. So in your spirit, you already are experiencing that resurrection life. Progressively, your mind and your will is also meant to experience that. Ultimately, your bodies. So, this is absolutely supernatural. You being in Christ today is supernatural. 
you seeing the crucified christ as someone to keep looking at is supernatural so boast in him amen Jesus. So let's just treasure those, those words that um, Evan has brought because it was so powerful. And sometimes after we hear messages, we just let it go. But can we just sit and just meditate on like what has been shared um, and start to treasure them, start to lock them away in your hearts so you can have them, you can store them and, and they can be a source of strength to us this week and we're going to take the communion now should we um, come up and take the elements can we come around the sides and then go through the middle and we'll just think about the cross and the blood And it reaches to the highest mountain And it flows to the lowest valley The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. And it reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows. To the lowest valley, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. And it reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day. Today, you will never lose its power. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood and your body. And we thank you, Lord, this is not a symbol, but we're actually coming to the table of the Lord. And I didn't have anything profound to say and when I was praying yesterday, but I just heard the word nourish. Let him nourish you in this moment. Let him give you everything that you need. And I don't know what, where you're at, whether you're in the, on the mountain or in the valley or in between. Come to him just as you are. And I really felt like I needed to get out the way. And we need to mature and come to Christ, not through a person, not through anyone's words, but let's come to Christ as a family, with a family of God. This is a family meal, but let's come to Christ. It's so simple. Let's picture him on the cross. The journey that he made carrying the cross. And every word that was shouted at him 
every beating that he endured, the way he was flogged and spat on, and his skin tore, the way they put our weak Lord on the cross, and they took those nails, and they hammered it into his hands and his feet. They took the crown of sharp thorns and they drove it into his head and crimson blood poured down his face. He made a way. We come to you, Jesus, not pretending to be strong, but Lord, I am weak. I'm struggling. I feel tired. I want you, Jesus, to come and nourish me. And when I got the word nourish, Ephesians 5.29 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. We are the body, and he is the head. And it is his joy and his happiness to nourish you. Because when he nourishes you, he nourishes himself. So I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, let's just give thanks for the sacrifice. for your flesh, for your body. He broke it. Thank you, Jesus, that your body was broken and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. Nourish us. Strengthen us. Give us sustenance. Sustain us. Be our life so that we can grow healthy. That we can mature into the head. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper. Saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Thank you Jesus that you're in covenant with us. You are our bridegroom, our husband. We thank you for all the promises we have in the new covenant. We just apply the blood to us. Let's drink the blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We just proclaim the Lord's victorious death and resurrection over every situation, over every area that needs healing and deliverance. We proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection power into every area that needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Evan, for our word, bro. Really blessed. It learned a lot as well. Thanks. <laughs> love you. Come on, just look at him. He's in that back corner. Say, we love you. <laughs> love you, bro. Thank you, Rach, for leading us through communion. Um, <clears throat> anybody's first Sunday with us, can you just put your hand up so that we want to get to know you? Hi, what's your name? Fifa, welcome. Welcome. Who's going to be? Who's here? Who's here? I'm going to try. Rachel. Well, Rachel will just take communion. She'll come and say hi to you. We want to get to you. What's your name? Joshua. Welcome, Joshua. Good to see you, man. Uh, Eben, who preached today, he's going to come and say hi to you. We want to get to know you. Anybody else? First Sunday with us. We just want to say hi. We want to get to know you. Glenn. Glenn. Glenn's already family. So welcome, Glenn. This is Glenn here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, have you met Glenn? 
not yet. There you go. He's right here, and you can meet Glenn. <laughs> yeah, welcome, Glenn. We love you. Um, and if you're shy to put your hand up, it's all right. Yeah, you can still put your hand up now if you want. Right. <laughs> God bless. Now, if you don't, um, if you have some family, if you see someone new, go, go, go say hi to them. Uh, grab them, say that. Um, quick announcements. We have home groups, Unite Home Groups, and our... As a church, we believe that we are not a Sunday-centric church. There's nothing called Sunday-centric Christianity. There's no Sunday Christian as well. So we believe in fellowshipping throughout the week, being in touch throughout the week, being fellowship throughout the week, uh, singing hymns, sharing scriptures. So if you want to be part of our home group, this handsome man here, Matthew Chan, could you please stand up? <laughs> there you go. That, yeah, so give your name to him. I'd encourage you, if you're part of Capstone Church, to be part of a home group. If you're not part of the church, also be, you can be part of a home group. Revive London Conference. Yep, that one. Go on. Well-timed. Timing. You, you must be, like, musical, <laughs> I'd say. But, but this conference is this weekend. It starts on Thursday. So Christian and Toyin, they're leading it. We have Virginia. Uh, we have Dominic Lemur and a whole array of awesome men and women of God, and I want to encourage that everyone in Capstone should come and attend this, and if you're working and you're unable to, because a lot of people came and told me that I can't do the Thursday or Friday, come the Saturday, yeah, come the Saturday and sow five or ten pounds to this. I know, I've known Christian for close to 20 years, and that man has stood strong for God, proclaiming the gospel to every creature for the t past 20 years that I've known him. That fire in him has not gone down, if at, all, if at all, it's setting ablaze others. And we must know, just as Eben says, we must know God. We must know the scriptures. We must know how to communicate the gospel. You and I got saved when someone preached or shared Jesus with us. Okay, this is equipping and training. Not only will they train you, you go out with them as well. And they'll take you with you and show you how to go about this. All right, and it's not just about preaching on the streets alone. That is very powerful. I've done it, okay? It's one of the best things. But it's also how do you share about Jesus at your workplace, in your neighborhood, with your family. How many of us have unsaved family members, family and friends? I think it's everyone, okay? So how will you share Jesus with them? This is going to be training for that. Keep this in prayer, Capstone family. And I think that's the, that's the wrap of announcements. Uh, if you're here first time, you can scan this QR code so we can get in touch with you and get to know you. We have tea and coffee downstairs after this. Let's all just stand up for the final prayer. Hallelujah. Come on, just praise him. Just, just say thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are worthy, God. God, we thank you that we get to start the week with you in fellowship, receiving your word, taking communion together, worshiping together, oh Lord. What an honor, Father God, to behold you. And through this week, Jesus, we keep you in our sight. We keep you as number one. We keep you as priority. Cover each and every one with your precious blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you guys. And.